Good morning, and welcome to worship on this sixth Sunday in Easter. My name is Pastor Seth Novak, and on behalf of the entire congregation of On East Day, I'd like to thank you for being a part of this worship service today. Our building may be closed, but the church is still open. You can download a worship bulletin with the order of service from the link in the video description below. Today, May 9th, is the day on which we celebrate Count Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf as a hymn writer and a renewer of the church. Zinzendorf was born in 1700 in Dresden. He was raised Lutheran but was heavily influenced by the Pietist movement in Europe and is actually more well-known among the Moravian Church. Because in 1722, Zinzendorf offered asylum to a number of persecuted wanderers from Moravia and Bohemia. He permitted them to build the village of Herrnhut on a corner of his estate in Berthelsdorf. The village grew until it became known as a place of religious freedom, and it attracted individuals from a wide variety of persecuted groups. However, the diversity in, of religious beliefs among those people created tension, and the village fell into severe conflict. Zinzendorf finally left court at Dresden and moved back to his estate full-time to devote himself to reconciliation of the conflict. He visited the home of each individual inhabitant for prayer. He led the people there in an intense study of the scriptures. And out of that process eventually was, uh, resulted the code for a community known as the Moravian Covenant for Christian Living. Zinzendorf was made a bishop in the Moravian Church and is celebrated as one of its early influential leaders. I particularly appreciate that he followed his heart and lived out his faith across denominational lines, something that was both rare and sometimes potentially dangerous in that time. And now, our own Evangelical Lutheran Church in America has a full communion agreement with the Moravian Church, and I like to think of that as part of Zinzendorf's legacy. He also note, wrote several well-known hymns, including Jesus Still Lead On. In his hymns, in our understanding of church that is larger than one denomination, and in our call to Christian love and community, we give thanks today for the legacy of Nicholas von Zinzendorf and for all the saints who have followed the call of Jesus and extended welcome to those in need. Before we begin our worship, I'll invite us to take a moment to share prayer requests from our community. You can use this time to share any prayers of concern or gratitude that you may have, being mindful of privacy in this public space. Today, we also remember in prayer Rob P., who had shoulder surgery this week. He expects to have four to six months of recovery, and so we pray for strength and patience and healing in that time. You'll also have the opportunity to include your prayers in the intercessory prayers before we celebrate Holy Communion. I'll now invite you to turn to your bulletin as we continue with our order of service. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. Worthy is Christ, the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be people of God. Power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and blessing and glory are His. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia! Sing with all the people of God and joy of 
victory for our God, for the Lamb who was slain has begun his reign. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, you have prepared for those who love you such joys beyond understanding. Pour into our hearts such love for you, that loving you above all things, we may obtain your promises, which exceed all we can desire. Through Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading is from the 10th chapter of Acts. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even to the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for a couple of days. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God.
Our second reading is from the fifth chapter of 1 John. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this we know that we love the children of God, and we love God and obey his commandments. For the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome, for whatever is born of God conquers the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. Who is it that conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with water only, but with the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, for the Spirit is the truth. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Gospel of the Lord is in the 15th chapter of John. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Live within my love. When you obey me, you are living in my love, just as I obey my Father and live in his love. I have told you this, so you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your cup of joy will overflow. I demand that you love each other as much as I love you. And here is how to measure it. The greatest love is shown when a person lays down his life for his friends. And you are my friend if you obey me. I no longer call you slaves, for a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends, proved by the fact that I to told you everything the Father told me. You didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lovely fruit always. So no matter what you ask for from the Father, using my name, he will give it to you. I demand that you love each other. The Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Did you know that in the United States, the standard distance between railroad rails is four feet, eight and a half inches. Why is it such an odd number? Legend has it that it is because that's the way they built them in England and American railroads were designed by British immigrants. Why did the English adapt this particular gauge? Because the people who built the pre-railroad tramways used that gauge. They in turn were locked into that gauge because the people who built the tramways used the same standards and tools they had used for building wagons, which were set on a gauge of four feet, eight and a half inches. Why were the wagons built to that scale? Because with any other size, the wheels did not match the old wheel ruts that were on the roads. So who built these old rugged roads? The first long distance highway in Europe were built by Imperial Rome for the benefit of their legions. The roads have been in use ever since. The ruts were first made by Roman war chariots. Four feet, eight and a half inches was the width a chariot needed to be to accommodate the rear ends of two war horses. Maybe because we've always done it that way isn't the best reason to continue doing something the same way. Of course, life is full of changes. If you are anything like me, I only like change when it's my idea. And even then, I reserve the right to change my mind. One thing that is almost always true is that even good changes come with stress and anxiety. I like to think of life's changes as coming in two forms. The first being a slow change with a happy ending like a caterpillar building its chrysalis and eventually emerging as a beautiful butterfly. The second kind of change is more like an anvil being dropped on one's head, like in the old Bugs Bunny and Roadrunner cartoons. It is sudden, surprising, 
frequently unwanted, and almost always transformative. This morning's Acts passage takes place just after Peter has experienced one of these anvil-type transformational experiences. Peter had believed and taught that you could not be a follower of Jesus unless you were Jewish first. He avoided unclean foods and situations. He knew that he was part of God's chosen people and that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. Peter believed that you could not be baptized and receive the Holy Spirit unless you were Jewish first. But the Holy Spirit had other ideas. In the town of Caesarea lived a man named Cornelius. Cornelius was a Gentile and a Roman centurion. He may have even driven one of those four foot, eight and a half wide war chariots that made the first road ruts. He was known as a good man who prayed often to God and cared for the poor. One afternoon in prayer, Cornelius had a vision. In this vision, an angel instructed him to send for Peter. After the angel left, Cornelius called two of his slaves and a devout soldier who served under him. After telling them about his vision, he sent them out to fetch Peter. Meanwhile, in a nearby town of Joppa, Peter also had a vision during his afternoon prayers. He saw the heavens open up and something like a large sheet coming down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners. In it were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. Then he heard a voice saying, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. The voice said to him again a second time, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times, and then the thing was suddenly taken back up into the heavens. Now, Peter was quite puzzled by this vision. But before he had time to reflect upon what he had seen, the visitor sent by Cornelius arrived. The spirit told Peter, I have sent these visitors to you. Get up and go with them. Peter obeys and goes with them to the home of Cornelius. But before they leave, they have a meal together, breaking the Jewish law that prohibits Jews from eating with Gentiles. When Peter arrived at Cornelius' house, he found that many were gathered there to listen to Peter speak. He began to speak to those gathered there saying, I truly understand that God shows no partiality but in every nation, anyone who fears God and does what is right is acceptable to God. While Peter is speaking, the Holy Spirit descended upon all who heard the word. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were astounded to see the gift of the Holy Spirit being poured out upon the Gentiles. The Holy Spirit leapt over boundaries, breaking not only old laws and traditions, but breaking the boundaries that separated people. The resurrection of Jesus meant that even the boundary of death had been broken, and all who believe in Jesus receive forgiveness of sin and eternal life. This means that God's grace, blessing, and presence are available to absolutely anybody. Who would we be astonished to see the Holy Spirit descend upon? Maybe that woman who has given birth to five drug-affected babies and is pregnant with number six. Or perhaps that homeless man who has been begging on the same street corner for years. How about the convict who was just released from prison? Or the refugee family whose language and customs we don't understand? Perhaps it would be that misfit that no one talks to and has withdrawn or withdrawn into their home alone. The Holy Spirit is a wild, unruly force who has no regard for human rules and boundaries. As followers of Jesus, we are called to demonstrate this unruly, boundary-breaking love to those whom the world excludes. 
Peter was no stranger to anvil style change and transformation. Prior to this experience, Peter and his colleagues were resistant to allowing the inclusion of Cornelius and his household. Now, following this divine intervention, he must return to, the commun to his community and admit that he was wrong to exclude and to share what God has taught him through the Holy Spirit. Like the waters of baptism that cannot be contained, God's love permeates and overflows any attempt to limit its growth. The Holy Spirit seldom holds still. She arrives without warning in surprising and unexpected places and without regard to the conventions of organized religion. She continues to intervene in our lives and helps guide us in widening the circle of God's love and joy. This morning, I invite you to close your eyes and picture our church and the community that it serves. Take a moment to listen to that still, small voice. What might the Holy Spirit be calling you to do? Where is she leading us as a church community? What rules or boundaries need to be broken or changed? How can we work together to be the change and blessing the world needs? May the Lord Jesus Christ give us the energy and imagination to keep up with the outward movements of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
alive in the risen Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, we bring our prayers before God, who promises to hear us and answer in steadfast love. Loving God, you call us to be a fruit-bearing church. Strengthen the bonds among all Christian churches. Today we pray for the Moravian Church, giving thanks for the life of the hymn writer, Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Creating God, the earth praises you. The oceans roar for joy and the hills echo. Fill the earth with your love. Teach us to join with all creatures of land and sea and sky who sing their songs in your praise. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Faithful Savior, you conquer the world, not with weapons, but with undying love. Plant your word in the hearts of the leaders of all nations. Give them your spirit so that peoples of the world can live in peace. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Caring healer, you forget no one. You accompany the lonely. Be present with those who are sick and suffering, especially those whom we name now aloud or in our hearts. Provide for those who need homes or medical care. Point us toward the right choices to change lives in our community. Be with the dying. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Gracious God, as a mother comforts her child, you comfort us. Bless the mothers and the mothering people in our lives. Comfort those who miss their mothers. Comfort all mothers who grieve. Comfort those who grieve because they cannot be mothers. Comfort those who have never known a mother's love. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Gentle Redeemer, all who die abide in your presence. Keep us united with our loved ones in your lasting mercy. We remember with thanksgiving those who shared your tenderness throughout their lives, especially those we name now aloud or in our hearts. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. In the hope of new life in Christ, we raise our prayers to you through Jesus, our Lord. Amen.
Let us pray. God of love, you call us beloved children and welcome us to your table. Receive our lives and the gifts we offer. Abide with us and send us in service to a suffering world. For the sake of your beloved child, Jesus Christ. Amen. As we prepare our hearts and our homes to receive the Lord's Supper, let us pray. Alleluia. Glory to you, O God, for from the garden to the wilderness, through exile, oppression, and return, you have delivered your people time and again from the grip of death. In the depths of darkest night, your word has shone as a beacon through your servants, the prophets, promising life and love in the face of death. That light became flesh and lived among us in the person of your Son, Jesus Christ, who has raised up from the earth to draw all people to himself. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. As often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we remember the Lord's death until he comes again. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Reveal our risen Lord to us in the breaking of the bread. Raise us up with Jesus as the body of Christ for the world. Believing in the witness of his resurrection, we await his coming in power to share with us the great and promised feast. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Send now, we pray, your Holy Spirit, that we who share in Christ's body and blood may live to the praise of your glory and join with all your saints scattered in houses and apartments and even in graves in the feast which has no end. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. With your holy ones of all times and places, with the earth and all its creatures, with sun and moon and stars, we praise you, O God of life, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. If you're not receiving the meal this morning, receive this blessing. May the joy of the risen Christ be in you, and may your joy be made complete. Amen. If you are receiving the meal this morning, Hear these words of promise. This is the body of Christ given for you.
This is the blood of Christ shed for you. May the body and blood of our risen Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in life that is abundant and eternal. Amen. Let us pray. Wellspring of joy, through this meal you have put gladness in our hearts. Satisfy the hunger still around us and send us as joyful witnesses that your love may bring joy to the hearts of all people. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May God, who has brought us from death to life, fill you with great joy. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Bless you now and forever. Amen. Before we conclude, I'd like to share just a few announcements. First of all, this afternoon from 1 to 2.30, we will once again host drive through communion at the Anu State Church parking lot. If you're local to the Gig Harbor area and you are invited to come and receive uh, communion in your car. If you can't make it today but you would like to participate, we're also planning another date on June 6th. In 2017, our congregation, in partnership with Peninsula Lutheran Church and with Lutheran Community Services Northwest, sponsored a refugee family here in Tacoma. That family has made their home here and are now thriving. The need for sponsorship continues as the Biden administration prepares to increase the U.S. refugee cap from its historically low numbers. Our congregation is once again considering whether we have the resources and the passion to welcome and support another family as they come to make their home here. If you're interested in making this happen, please contact Sister Anne, and she will help you connect with uh, the new resettle- re- excuse me, with the new resettlement committee as it forms. Thank you for being a part of this community. community. It's good for us to gather here as God's people and to be renewed in faith and reassured in God's promises. If you found today's service meaningful, please be sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel where On You Stay gathers for worship every Sunday at 9.45 a.m. And be sure to follow us on, find us on the web at onyoustaylutheran.org to get involved in Bible studies, service groups, and many other ministries aimed at loving and serving our neighbors here and in the world. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. You are the body of Christ, raised up for the world. Go in peace. Share the good news. Thanks be to God. The peace of our risen Lord be with you always.